Shalom. Welcome to Yeshiva Pirkei Shoshanim here on the T. My name is Devon. And I am Diego Porco. And today we are going to be dealing with <clears throat> the Mashiach. This is basically a uh, part two of what we covered last week. And um, we gave the concept of Mashiach. Today we're going to deal with some actual prophecies of what the Messiah will actually do. In contrast to a very specific verse in the New Testament, which contradicts the whole Tanakh concept of Messiah. So I'm going to share my screen and show you this. Can you see that? Yep. So it says now when asked, this is Luke 17, 20 through 21. Now, when he was asked by the Pharisees, when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them and said, the kingdom of God does not come with observation, nor will they say, see here or see there, for indeed, the kingdom of God is within you. So it's interesting that he would say this because if we're if we're dating the Gospels, which is a lot of controversy surrounding dating them. Why would he say the kingdom of God is within you if Throughout the Gospels, he says, you will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds. You will see this. You will see that, right? Like, all of a sudden, it's all you. You can't see it now. It's, 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 a, it's a mental thing. It's within you, right? <laughs> Whatever you can imagine. So this is one of the reasons you got so many denominations, because this verse can be interpreted any way you want, you know? Um, and it, it's not consistent with the Tanakh. So let's go right to the Tanakh. Because the Christians will always love to say Jesus fulfilled, fulfilled the Tanakh, right? He fulfilled the prophecies. Well, if the kingdom of God is within you, what is it? What exactly does this prophecy entail? This is Isaiah chapter two, verses one through four. Very important messianic prophecy word that Isaiah, the son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. Now it shall come to pass in the latter days, <clears throat> in the latter days, that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow to it. Many people shall come and say, come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways and we shall walk in his paths, for out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations and rebuke many people. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, nor shall they learn war anymore. That has to be observed in order to come to pass. The nations mm -hmm. that have to... You have to travel. You have to go to Jerusalem. You have to go to the house of God. You can't do that in your mind. This is a yeah. physical act. So this would not work with Luke's telling, when Luke tells us that the kingdom is within you. That, that, that's not consistent with the actual prophecy of nations not learning war anymore. You have to physically get rid of your weapons. You, <laughs> you can't have peace on earth in your mind when people can still go out and shoot each other. You know, it just yeah. it, it's not it's not consistent. So that's one piece. Here's another piece. Another very famous messianic prophecy. This is Isaiah chapter 11. There shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse. And a branch shall grow out of his roots. The spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. The spirit of wisdom and understanding. The spirit of counsel and might. The spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. His delight is in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by the sight of his ears. Nor decide by the hearing of his ears. I'm sorry, he shall not judge by the sight of his eyes. Nor decide by the hearing of his ears. But with righteousness he shall judge the poor. In order to be a judge you have to talk to people. You can't do this in your mind. People can't go to court in their mind and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he shall slay the wicked. 
Righteousness shall be the belt of his loins and faithfulness the belt of his waist. The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb. The leper shall lie down with the goat. So some commentaries say that this just means peace on earth, not a physical wolf land with the lamb or a shepherd with the goat. But it just means because some interpret the lamb to actually be um, Israel and the wolves are the nations. So let's let's just say that if that's the case, this has to be observed. This has to be something seen. This is not within people's mind. Then the calf yeah. and the young lion and the fatling together. Again, if there's going to be physical peace or metaphorical peace, um, you know, it's still got to be something physically observed. And the little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze. Their young ones shall lie down together and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play on the cobra's hole and the weaned child shall put his hand in the viper's den. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. This has to be physically observed because today atheism is all over the world. The knowledge of God does not permeate the world. And in that day, there should be a root of Jesse who shall stand as a banner to the people. What's a banner? You have to see this banner. It's like a sun, it's like a signal. When you when you when there when there's parades, people hold up banners so everybody can see what's the parade about, right? <laughs> so it doesn't make sense that you the kingdom is within. For Gentiles shall seek him, and his resting place shall be glorious. What are the Gentiles going to seek if it's just all in everybody's mind? I can imagine whatever I want, and the next man can imagine whatever he wants. It shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set his hand again the second time to recover the remnant of his people who are left from Assyria and Egypt, from Pathros and Cush, from Elam and Shinar, from Hamath and the islands of the sea. That's a lot of people who are going to be doing some traveling back to Israel. You have to see this. This is something to be witnessed. He will set up a banner for the nations and will assemble the outcasts of Israel and gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. Also, the envy of Ephraim shall depart and the adversaries of Judah shall be cut off. Ephraim shall not envy Judah and Judah shall not harass Ephraim. So if the, the adversaries of Judah are cut off, that's peace between the nations like Isaiah chapter two talked about. Again, this is something to be witnessed. They shall fly down upon the shoulder of the Philistines toward the west. Together they shall plunder the people of the east. They shall lay their hand on Edom and Moab, and the people of Ammon shall obey them. They will utterly destroy the tongue of the Sea of Egypt. With his mighty hand, he will shake his fist over the river and strike it in, seven, in the seven streams and make men cross over dry shod. There will be a highway for the remnant of his people who will be left from Assyria as it was for Israel. And in that day, he came up from the in the in the in the, <clears throat> in the day that he came up from the land of Egypt. So if there's going to be a highway, the uh, river is going to be struck in the seven streams. People's crossing over it. They're coming back from all these countries. This is a massive exodus back into the land of Israel. Go ahead, Teal. You want to say something? Well, yeah, you know, especially if you look at from verse 11, it's, to be honest, it's problematic, you know, uh, for, of course, if um, you still believe in um, Jesus being the one being spoken about here. So we understand that the, the Christians will say this is a messianic prophecy, of course, and but they will say that it points to Jesus. So verse 11 then, you see, there is another doctrine within Christianity that is very problematic, and that is um, replacement theology. With the replacement theology, the the other nations they become now Israelites. You know, yeah, I'm an Israelite. Um, <laughs> it's it's very problematic. I actually even asked a friend of mine, and unfortunately, I didn't get an answer. And I said, let's look at verse eleven. You know. God says he will he will start uh, he will bring back all the scattered children of Israel the ten lost tribes 
and also the, the tribe of Judah, he will gather them from four corners of the earth, right? And therefore, if everyone now, he's a Jew, everyone is an Israelite, how then do we then make peace with, how do we um, bring these two together? Everyone now who believes in Jesus is a, he's a now an Israelite. How then do you emerge these two and make them one? They are both like fighting each other. And we will see also when we go to Ezekiel chapter 37, the same thing is still outlined there in detail mm -hmm. that God will bring together the, the, the children of Israel, right? It's one of the biggest things that actually marks to define if someone is a, is a messiah. Um, I, I think I was reading one of the books where it says Rambam was, uh, Rambam was actually giving about six lists of things that a, a messiah should do in order to say, okay, he's messiah. They say, the, I think the first four, they will, if you uh, do all those four, they will say there's the possibility that you are messiah, but where they become 100% sure that you are messiah is when you can do the two, the engathering and the rebuilding of the temple. Yes, if, which is things we will see. That, Yes, you know, so where the moment those two things are fulfilled, then 100% sure we can say you are the Messiah. Yep, good points, good, good points. Um, <clears throat> let's go to Ezekiel 37. <clears throat> so if we start in verse 15. It says, again, the word of the Lord came to me saying, as for you, son of man. And son of man here, guys, is not referring to Jesus. It's referring to Ezekiel. <clears throat> Take for yourself. And, 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 and Dave, Dave, I think it's very important what you just said. Now, the son of man, uh, we already see son of man, it refers to a human being, right? A normal human being. Right. And so when, when, whenever the Bible says the son of man, it has never referred to someone who is a, a divine being. And so it's, it's probably, it's just, just, just on the side, you know, to, to say, even in the Christian literature, if they want to take certain things from a Tanakh, they should have that understanding that whenever Tanakh says son of man, it's literally a human being, just like me and you. And therefore, if they want to take that, they should apply it also on their Bible to say, son of man literally means a human being. Not, not only that, because that's a good point. Not only that, literally, the son of man is the son of Adam, is what it really says in the Hebrew. Mm -hmm. Son of, of man is really saying son of Adam, um, Adam which is exactly. a... Which not human, dumb. Yeah, exactly. You know, it's literally a human being. So, and the fact that Ezekiel is called son of man so many times, and then all of a sudden Jesus takes the claim to this word, it's just replacement theology. Like you said, all of a sudden when you people talk about the son of man, it's always about Jesus. But it's like, no, Ezekiel came way before this. So Ezekiel uh, 37, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do 15 through 28. Again, the word of the Lord came to me saying, and the T.O. is jumping in any time. Again, the word of the Lord came to me saying, as for you, son of man, take a stick for yourself and write on it for Judah and for the children of Israel, his companions. Then take another stick and write on it for Joseph, the stick of Ephraim, and for all the house of Israel, his companions. Then join them one to another for yourself into one stick, and they will come, become one in your hand. And when the children of your people speak to you saying, will you not show us? By what <clears throat> will you not show us what you mean by these? Say to them, thus says the Lord God, surely I will take the stick of Joseph, which is in the hand of Ephraim and the tribes of Israel, his companions, and I will join them with it, with the stick of Judah and make them one stick and they will be one in my hand. And the sticks on which you write will be in your hand before their eyes. Then say to them, thus says the Lord your God, surely I will take the children of Israel from among the nations. So like you said earlier, if all the nations that are the church are now Israel, who is being taken from among them? I will take the children of Israel from among the nations, 
wherever they have gone, and I will gather them from every side and bring them into their own land. Excuse me. We're going to have to see this Israel coming into their own land, and I will make them one nation in the land on the mountains of Israel and one king. One king shall be a king over them all. There shall no longer be two nations, nor shall they ever be divided into two kingdoms again. They shall not defile themselves anymore with their idols. So we're going to have to see idols going away, nor with their detestable things, nor with any of their transgressions. So that means they're going to stop sinning. But I will deliver them from all their dwelling places in which they have sinned and will cleanse them. Then they shall be my people and I will be their God. We're going to see everybody getting rid of their idols, getting rid of the churches, and only the God of Israel will be served. David, my servant, shall be king over them. Now, we know <clears throat> this is not physically King David. This will be a son of David. But the, the, the way the Tanakh speaks, is sometimes it says house of David. Sometimes it just says David. It's referring to the kingdom that was given to David. So this, is, this would be Mashiach. David, my servant, shall be king over them. And they shall have one shepherd and shall walk in my, my judgments and observe my statutes and do them. This goes right in the face of Paul, who says you're not under the law anymore. It says to do them. You have to actually observe yeah. the law. Tough, you know? Then they shall dwell in the land that I have given to Jacob, my servant. Jesus talks about going away and preparing a place for you and his kingdom is not part of this world in John 18. But right here, it says they will dwell in the land that I have given to Jacob, my servant, where your fathers mm -hmm. dwelt. This is on earth. This is a physical kingdom and they shall dwell there. They and their children. I, Go ahead. Yeah. So what I always say, you know, I, I like putting it this way. We have what to call this what you call Christian eschatology, mm -hmm. right? And then there's a Jewish eschatology. And I was saying to friends, it's weird that Christian and Jewish eschatology is completely different. You can put the end time prophecies according to Christianity and the end time prophecies according to Tanakh, two different things. In, in Tanakh, we see the ingathering, it's very important. The rebuilding of, of the temple, very mm -hmm. important. And um, the, 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 what you call the sacrificial system being reestablished, uh, brought back again, right? And we see Messiah being there leading, right? And then on the other side, it's completely different. There is a city that is coming from heaven that is made of gold. Right, and completely, completely, completely different. And then I was saying to someone, you need to actually go through Tanakh, put eschatology of Tanakh this side, and then put the eschatology of the Christian Bible, and then decide which one you want to go with. And then here's another thing though. The Christian Bible depends upon the Tanakh. And Tanakh came first. And Tanakh has been proven to be the word of God many times. The, the likes of Isaiah, Jeremiah, and others, they had to be tested, right? And they have, we are 100% sure, even a, no Christian will say, I'm not sure if Jeremiah is, is, uh, was a prophet of God. But now here's the thing. If the new goes against the old, stick with the old. That has been proven to be true. Yeah. So that's the, put both of them here and decide. But I'm saying to you, when you decide which eschatology you go with, remember that the new depends on the old. And if the new goes against the old, stick with that which has been proven to be true. You bring up a very good point. Um, so how to make decisions in the Tanakh? And um, I have to, I'm going to come back to Ezekiel, but I, I'm glad you brought this up because this is very important. I posted this on Facebook a couple of days ago, and um, people are asking me to actual, to, to use this verse, to ask Christians this question 
about the validation of the New Testament. So everybody's familiar with the Council of Nicaea. Remember, we were supposed to do a lesson on Council of Nicaea. Some of you, your friends are asking about that. Okay, so at the Council of Nicaea, it was basically Christians deciding what books of the New Testament to put in, right? Which ones were going to be discarded, which ones were, were going to be added. So how was the Tanakh put together? The Tanakh was put together by the men of the Great Assembly, which consisted of prophets and very high-level uh, uh, scholars of the Tanakh. Um, so in Deuteronomy 17, we pretty much get an outline of this. It says, Deuteronomy 17, verse 8, if a matter arises which is too hard for you to judge between degrees of guilt for bloodshed, between one judgment or another, or between one punishment or another, matters of controversy within your gates, then you shall arise and go to the place which the Lord your God chooses, and then and you shall come to the priests, the Levites. Levites have been replaced in the New Testament. And to the judge there in those days and inquire of them and shall they shall pronounce upon you the sentence of judgment. You shall do according to the sentence which they pronounce upon you in that place which the Lord chooses. And you shall be careful to do according to all that they order you, according to the sentence of the law in which they instruct you according to the judgment. Powerful. Say what? I'm saying this is powerful. Yeah. According to the judgment which they tell you, you shall do. You shall not turn aside to the right hand or to the left from the sentence which they pronounce upon you. Now the man who acts presumptuously and will not heed the priest who stands to minister there before the Lord your God or the or the judge, that man shall die. You shall not. So you shall put away evil from Israel and all the people shall hear and fear and no longer act presumptuously. So if there was not a priest, a Levite or a judge of Israel at the Council of Nicaea who had the authority to say this is the word of God when most of the New Testament books don't even claim to be the word of God. They tell you their letters, their personal letters written to individual people sometimes. They're even addressed to Theophilus. Luke tells you, I'm writing this to Theophilus, and he says, after many have taken upon themselves to write their version of the gospel, I'm going to write my version. How is that the word of God? You know, I was saying to someone, I, actually, I want, I want to do this presentation. I haven't done it, but I've been thinking about it for many uh, days now, months. And that is, go through the Tanakh and just capture the first few lines of uh, the, each book, right? And see how they start the book and compare it with how the Christian Bible books are started. I'm writing this to whoever, and then mm -hmm. see how it differs from the Tanakh. Completely different. Completely. The other one, the, the word of God came to me. That's completely different. The word of God came to me. And the other side, no, I'm writing to so and so who was there, you know, in Rome or wherever. <laughs> it's completely different. Personal letters. He's yeah, he's not even claiming to 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 say the the word of God came uh, unto me and one you know nothing like that. Nothing and actually. So I, I, I would, I would not to like get too to far off it. subject. Let's let's just read how and Luke claims to have the most reliable gospel. That's how he starts his book. Look at this in the New King New King James Version. It says <laughs> dedication to Theophilus. Who's Theophilus? He's this is not. This is not God speaking here. Luke chapter one, verse one. And as much as many, I want, I want to, can you see my, am I highlighting that? Yes. And as much as many have taken in hand to set in order a narrative of those things which have been fulfilled among us, just as those who are, who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word delivered them to us. It doesn't tell you God gave you this word. It says eyewitnesses. This is people so hearsay, word of mouth. It seemed good to me also. Oh, y'all writing a version? I'm a journalist too. I'm going to write me a book too. Having had <laughs> perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write to you an orderly account, most excellent Theophilus that you may certainly know the things in which you were instructed. 
Luke tells and, you and this is not the word David, of God. Yeah, Dave, the last verse, and then we go back to what we we're talking about. Ezekiel chapter 1, verse 3. Let's just see how the prophets of God started the, uh, their books. The, uh, yeah, verse 3. Now it came to pass in the 13th year, in the fourth month, on the fifth day of the month, as I was among the captives by the river Kabar, that the heavens were open and I saw visions of God. I saw visions of God. Mm-hmm. Not and verse, three, and verse three, and the word of the Lord came expressly. The word of Can the Lord get came better? expressly to the priest. And the hand of the Lord was upon me. Yeah. <laughs> so this is what we call the word of God. He doesn't tell I you. Think, actually, I, I never, I never thought about this. Until a couple of days ago. Where exactly does anybody claim that God spoke to them in the New Testament? Specifically, besides Paul saying, I have the spirit of God. He says that, right? Paul says, I have the spirit of God on me. But nobody else says, and the word of the Lord came upon me to write this to you. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. nobody else is like writing personal letters and and nobody else is making their, nobody else has to try to prove that God spoke to them. The New Testament is full of constantly trying to convince you. The book of John says this was written in order to, 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 to get you to believe. Mm. You know what I'm saying? It's constantly trying. It's a, it's a it's a very poor way of trying to convince you this is true. This is what's going on. That's not what's happening in the, in the Tanakh. It's not trying to convince you. It's just telling you what the matter, what what happened. God came yeah. to me and said, "This is going to happen. This this that happened. That that happened." The New Testament is constantly trying to convince you of something, and it's not it's not the, these personal letters to people um the most excellent theophilus oh i'm writing to you phoebe or you know paul's got all these letters to people how is that god speaking it's not it's not it's completely not so it's a completely different approach to 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 bring in the to the, the 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 word of god to people and it's not it's, it's not even presented as if God's speaking. It's basically people yeah. giving their, their, you know, their test. And that's why there's so many contradictions because they're just eyewitness accounts. And, you know, when you're dealing with just people, not prophets, regular people are going to give different accounts. And the fact that the New Testament didn't even take time to go and clean it up, mm. you know, and, and all these people, they didn't even, you know, they, they weren't able to look. Matthew wasn't able to know exactly what Luke wrote when it was written. Now, we, we know there's traditions that they took Matthew used Luke's gospel. And Mark lose, used Matthew's gospel, depending on what scholar you ask. They was using each other's yeah. gospels and writing their stories. That's not using the God. Why do you need these other books to write the book if, it's the, if supposedly the Holy Spirit gave it? Jesus hey. says... The Holy Spirit will teach you all things when he leaves, right? So why isn't sure. the Holy Spirit the one doing the given this the revelation? The whole thing, yes. You know, it just it just doesn't make sense. It doesn't work. So going back to the prophecy in Ezekiel 37, we just had to kind of sidebar on how exactly the 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 the, the Torah speaks to us versus the New Testament's. You know, eyewitness accounts as opposed to a prophet giving you the, 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 the word. So I stopped in verse 25, Ezekiel 37. It says, then they shall dwell in the land that I have given to Jacob, my servant, where your fathers dwelt, and they shall dwell there. They, their children and their children's children forever. And my servant David shall be their prince forever. My servant doesn't say I 
will be their prince forever. So God did not, is not going to become a man and sit on David's throne. My servant shall be their prince forever. And you notice he calls him a prince, even though to us he would be a king, but to God he would be a prince because the prince is under the king, right? <clears throat> Moreover, I will make a covenant of peace with them. Jesus said he didn't come to bring peace. And it shall be an everlasting covenant with them, and I will establish them and multiply them. Doesn't the New Testament say men will not be given in marriage anymore? They will be it's, like the angels. How are you going to have children? Yes, yeah, a problem. I will <laughs> set my sanctuary in their midst forever. There's, there's a third temple right there. Why would you need a temple if you're not going to offer sacrifices anymore, according to the book of Hebrews? My yes, tabernacle shall also be with them. Indeed, I will be their God. <coughs> Excuse me. They shall be my people. The nations will all know that I, the Lord, sanctify Israel. Not believe. This is not going to be a belief in the future. My sanctuary is in their midst forever because they're going to see it. It's not going to be within this is not going to be a, a mental kingdom. <laughs> Go ahead. It is very powerful. It, 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 I'm going back to the to Christian eschatology. There is no mention of the sanctuary of the temple. Beit Hamikdash height. It is not there in the in the in, in the Christian eschatology, right? Because they've got a problem with uh, with uh, the sanctuary. You, you know, it's something that was there and. It's, no longer important. Uh, the only the what you call there will be a city of gold that comes from heaven coming down to, to earth. But now, if we claim that if you claim that the moment you become a Christian, you are now an Israelite, a spiritual Israelite, a replacement theology. It says in 28 there, the nations will also know if now everyone who becomes a Christian, he's a now Israelite. With, with nations now, you know? So the, 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 the replacement theology, indeed it shows people that have got, I'm sorry to say this, but I, I feel like a low self-esteem that I want all these things, the nice things that have been said about Israel to apply to me by force. I'm taking them by force. They will now apply to me. But I will not do with the commandments. I'm not, I don't have but to I'm do not going anything to do, to do <laughs> Exactly. Oh, that is a puff. I was actually even thinking about it, I think, earlier today to say, it's easy to say I'm an Israelite until someone says, okay, yeah, the mitzvot. Yeah, the commandments. Oh, we're not, we're under grace now. Then, now grace comes and, and, and it takes away everything. Was there no grace before? Is it, is it something new? Completely. New. Praise has always been there. We all want to understand it the way we want. It's very convenient to, to just talk. That's why it says, and they will do them. Where does it say it up here? It says, they will observe my law, my judgments, and do them. <laughs> it's right there. So, again, this is a very clear messianic prophecy. Israel will be gathered together into one nation in their land, that there will be a temple in the, the, my sanctuary is in their midst forever. The nation Ever. will know it. And here's the thing. When you continue with Ezekiel chapter 38, 39, going the other way and think 40, until 46, it gives actual measurements of the, of the, of the sanctuary, how it's going to be built, measurement for each everything. and everything. So Everything. I had someone saying it's not literal. <laughs> but, you know, that's a way of trying to run away from something that is obvious. Yeah. It's not literal, yeah. it's symbolic. Okay, if it's symbolic, let's say it's symbolic. What, what is it pointing to if it's not literal? If that's the case, then when it says the kingdom is within you, that means there is no kingdom, really. It's symbolic. It's not going to be a kingdom. Right? <laughs> it's in your mind, right? That it, it literally says that in Luke. It doesn't come with observation because he could not prove 
that the kingdom will, because he says the kingdom is here. The time is fulfilled, Mark 1, 15. His, his preaching was, it, it came back to hit him in the face because he's saying it's here. The kingdom of God has come upon you. When they said, he said, uh, if I'm doing miracles, if I'm casting out demons, that lets you know the kingdom of God is upon you. It's here. Nothing. Uh, Dave, can you quickly go to Matthew 16, 28? 1628. Yeah. Assuredly, I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. So if the kingdom doesn't come with observation, what are they going to see? Hmm. And why then are they still waiting when, I mean, those who are there they long died right so this is the excuse that you're gonna get so if we stay here it says uh, oh it's in 17 so this is the this is the excuse so it says now after six days jesus took peter james and john his, his brother and led them up on a mountain by themselves he was transfigured before them this is what the church will tell you was the kingdom of God. He was transfigured before them, right? His face shone like the sun, and his, his like the sun, his clothes became white as the light. They said, see, he showed them the kingdom of God. So I said, uh, the kingdom of God is Jesus shining like the light? How's what that happened to all the God? stuff in Isaiah Peace, no What about Ezekiel mm -hmm. chapter 37? Uh, no, only this light that he showed to three people. So the, the, these three people saw the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is lights, not worldwide knowledge of God, not peace on earth, not, no sanctuary, uh, no resurrection of the dead, none of that. It's just this light, right? Well, what's, what's funny about this is it says, behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them talking with him, right? Moses mm -hmm. is dead. Moses is dead, right? Yes. Well, let's just make sure that Moses is dead. In, in, I know in the church that I used to attend, they say there is a part that says... Uh, in one of the church writings, it says um, there was a <laughs> there was a fight on uh, uh, on the body of Moses after he was buried, and Satan wanted to can't remember what he wanted to do with the body of Moses. And there's a, in the book of Jude, I think there's an argument about the body of Satan or something, or the body of the, the body of Moses. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so they say so. God resurrected. Moses and then took him to heaven. Hmm. So I'm I, I know that, that there's that theory in, in the church that I used to attend. Oh, so they have their own oral Torah, but they reject the Torah oral Torah of the Pharisees. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, I'm so I'm I'm from the Stone Adventist. There's a, a prophet of the church called um Ellen G. White. She lived during the 1800s. And so she has written uh, apparently a lot of books. So all the theology of the church comes from, from those books. Okay. If, if it's something that you, it's confusing you, you go to, to, to her books. Oh. And, so they, they can make, make up anything they want. Well, if we're going off the Tanakh, it says, Moses, my servant, is dead. And you're not allowed to talk to the dead. So why was Jesus talking to Moses if that was the kingdom of God? Hey. When did Moses get resurrected? If you're gonna go with, if we're gonna go with her oral traditions, then you gotta accept all the Catholic traditions. Mary never had a uh, uh, Mary remained a virgin, even though Jesus had brothers and sisters. <laughs> I mean. Mary, yeah, actually, it's, Mary it's was born without sin, according to the Catholic tradition. So if Mary is born without sin, I'm sorry. 
Yeah, so I was saying to you, they've got a dilemma and you always have to be fixing all these problems, right? So if you see, oh, okay, in, in the book of Matthew 17, it says this, I have to come up with something that qualifies, that makes Matthew the word of God. Because mm -hmm. now if you just leave it like that, then it's a problem, it's problematic. So now we need to come up with uh, another theology as if it comes from Tanakh. Well, here's another problem that <clears throat> this theory raises. So if this is the kingdom of God, right? And Jesus talks to Moses and everything. It says, um, where is it at? Now, as they came down from the mountain, Jesus commanded them saying, tell the vision to no one until the son of man is risen from the dead, right? Don't tell nobody, right? But doesn't mm -hmm. he say in the book of John that I didn't teach nothing in secret? Yes. He Everything says, taught... is a special interpretation, and 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 it's 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 it's, uh, it's interesting. Jesus answered him. This is John eighteen twenty. Jesus answered him. I spoke openly to the world. I always taught in synagogues and in the temple where the Jews always met me, and in secret I have said nothing. Why did you tell them? Don't tell nobody. That's a secret. <laughs> no, this verse, you don't understand it. It really means this. <laughs> uh, it's always a game, right? So yeah. what we're getting at is the messianic prophecies are literal. They're physical. They're reality. You're going to see something. Whether the lamb will actually lay, lay down with the lion or that's metaphorical as far as there's going to be peace between Israel and the nations. You're going to see the peace. You're going to see the physical reality of the wars will stop on earth. It says they shall not hurt on my holy mountain. No more problems. People are going yeah. to flow to Jerusalem. You're going to see a mass exodus of people going to Israel to learn Torah. So mm. this is not something in your mind. So let's go to this last one. Because I know we wanted to keep these, you know, kind of short. Yeah, and, and I was so you, thinking, uh, Zechariah, Zechariah 12 and 13, let's make it a different, uh, another Okay, we lesson. can do that. We don't even have to go into that. Okay. It's very interesting. So well. I don't want us to put too much uh, info on in one right. video. I want us to speak it. Zechariah 12 and 13 is very important because this, you know, as a former Christian, we know that you will just run to one verse in, in there. Right, say, right. See, I just did a video right? so on we that too. Yes. So we need to go through the whole of 12 and the whole of 13. Believe me, it's not long, guys. Uh, we'll just quickly go through it, but we'll make it video three. And then we'll right. address uh, those few uh, verses that seems to be pointing to the understanding of Jesus here. Yeah, um, I want to end on this last verse. When you got questions, Zechariah 8, 23 says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, in those days, 10 men from every language of the nation shall grasp the sleeve of a ah. Jewish man, saying, let us go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. I asked the question, Dave, and I said to my friend, if Jews are these evil people, that God used to uh, to, 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 to call them my son and he abandoned them. How then do you just, how do you harmonize your version with what Zechariah 18.23 says? It says, everyone will say, now we know God is with you and you are saying to me, God has abandoned them. So how do you bring these two things together? You can't. Because, the, again, they ignored Deuteronomy 17. You go to the priests and the judges in those days, and the, the replacement theology is so rampant in the New Testament that it's, it, it, it's blinding because it demonizes the Tanakh so much. Paul calls it a curse. Jesus is mm -hmm. you know, always arguing woe to the scribes and Pharisees. But then he tells you to, to listen to them in Matthew 23. It says they sit in the seat of Moses. So you got to listen to them. Why would you why would you tell somebody to listen to somebody who's 
got all these problems, who are sons of the devil, and all the stuff that John says. And then it says, do what they teach, not what they do. I think it's Matthew 7 somewhere. Uh, Matthew 23. Mm -hmm. I can't remember, but yeah, do what they teach you what to do, but don't do what they do. Okay. okay. So if they teach something that is very good, then it's very confusing. Eh? Because now what they teach is literally against the, the, the Christian Bible. Exactly. That, and that's so, the problem right there. They're not going to tell you to follow Jesus. They're not going to tell you to listen to Paul. They're going to tell you to keep the Torah. They're going to tell you about mm -hmm. the oral Torah, which mm -hmm. the New Testament is full of the oral Torah. Ask any Christian, what's the Sabbath day's journey? And show me that in the Tanakh. And why was Jesus mm -hmm. and his disciples observing it? Why does Paul say, I'm sorry. Yeah, here's another thing that I wanted to post, but I will post it some other time. And I said, are you aware even the Christian denominations that keep Sabbath? Everyone is doing his own thing. No, like there's no unity. No one knows what it exactly, <laughs> you know. But in, in, in the Orthodox Judaism, there are 39 prohibited types of work, right? Everyone follows the same thing, regardless of where you are in the world. Right, but in Christianity, I was part of Seventh Adventists. We're keeping the Sabbath, and I was laughing after knowing the truth. Like, oh, I've never kept this day the, the way I thought I was keeping. Right, everyone does his own or her own thing. I will drive, the other one says, I will walk, the other one says, now I'll watch TV. The other ones, you know, there's no unity, no, there's no one way. But I understand where do they get it? No one knows how to keep the Sabbath. Only the Jews know what is the proper way of keeping the Shabbat. And therefore, if you keep running away from the Jews, you are closing yourself out of the truth. You have to go to the source. <clears throat> if, you don't, if you don't understand that the people whose language and culture are involved in the Tanakh, you can't just pick up somebody else's history and apply it to yourself and think that you're doing it accurately without knowing the, the culture, the language, j just the way things are just done. I mean, just how to cook certain foods and stuff like that. If I, if I, if I come to South Africa, which I've never been to Africa, and I say, T.O., this is how you guys make your fish. You're going to be and, like, and no, it's I not. Correct, and then I try to correct you, and you are stubborn. Exactly. <laughs> you know, you're going to be like, get out of here, man. You don't, you, you, you're, you, I'm you good. just now breathing our air. You know, you're going to come over here. <laughs> I actually have a video on that. And I, I asked here in South Africa and say, can you imagine if you've got a book that is written in your home language and it talks about your forefathers? It literally talks about your forefathers with their relationship with Hashem, with God. It's written in your home language, right? And then someone from Europe comes. He happens to hate you, but he likes the book. Right. <laughs> <laughs> he takes the book. He has got a problem. It's not written in the language that he understands. He goes and finds his own ways of understanding this book. But he does not have a deep understanding of the language, right? He has just learned the stuff. And he goes, translate it, and then he calls it, he calls it his book. And he goes around the world telling people that they have to follow this book, right? And then he also includes things that there's this punishment and all this thing if you don't take this. And you're sitting there and say, but this is this book was written. In my language, it talks about my forefathers. What you are saying there is not true. And then I come and say, no, come, let me teach you exactly. You don't have understanding. I will give you an understanding of what this book says. You don't even speak the language. And you're going to teach me what the book says. That's so what exactly other Christians are trying to do. They go to the Jews to tell them about, you don't have understanding of Jesus. You will be a fulfilled Jew. Right. Or a complete Jew. If it, 
Yeah, it's a, it's a very interesting, but anyway, it was very interesting uh, discussion, but I think we need to just quickly summarize what we, 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 we covered today, Dave. I think what was important today is we went through Isaiah chapter 11, and um, I don't know, any, any quick summary on chapter 11, Dave? Well, <clears throat> Isaiah basically 11, in a nutshell, is the gathering of Israel, the Messiah coming. Before, he's full of peace and he's full of wisdom. He's full of the fear of, fear of the Lord. And he's not God himself. He's a man, unless God fears himself. God is a son of Jesse. We've seen in Ezekiel, it says, mm -hmm. my servant will be their prince mm -hmm. forever. He doesn't say, I will come and be their prince. Yep. God never tells David that he's going to come and be his son. It even says in mm -hmm. Luke 132, Jesus will be given the throne of his father, David. So unless David is the father of Hashem, <laughs> right? It doesn't, it doesn't make any sense. So Isaiah chapter 2 basically says there's going to be peace on earth. All the nations will go to Jerusalem to learn Torah. Yeah. Um, and Ezekiel clearly tells us there's going to be a gathering of Israel. There's going to be a, a temple. And all these things are going to be physically seen and not believed. And like I was saying earlier, the New Testament is constantly trying to convince you to believe. Opposed to just displaying a reality. Moses did not have to convince Israel that they left Egypt. They left. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't have to convince them that... You know, Joshua didn't convince them that they, they went into the Holy Land. They went into the Holy Land. You know, David didn't run around convincing people he was the Messiah. He sat on the throne. So mm -hmm. we, we see the complete different approach to how the gospel is presented to people than how the Tanakh talks. Paul is constantly trying to convince you that his gospel is correct. If you don't believe in my gospel, you're cursed. Um, don't listen to other teachers. He's constantly doing damage control. Paul's really not teaching you nothing. He's cleaning up all these other doctrines. That's all he's talking about. What well, this guy's got this doctrine. He's a follower of Paul. He's a follower of him. Paul barely even really doesn't even really quote Jesus. If you read Paul, he doesn't even talk about the life of Jesus. Doesn't mention the virgin birth. He doesn't talk about nothing. Nothing really. Mm. He's, he's, he's got his own thing going on. And the New Testament is, is, if you took away the miracles, Jesus has nothing, but he's just a preacher. Because if you're yeah. not fulfilling the prophecies, then why would you expect the Jews to believe you? I have a video on my YouTube channel and on here on the TV. How did Jesus gain his disciples? Miracles. Mm. It miracles. wasn't because he fulfilled prophecy. He started off wow. doing miracles. And depending on which gospel you read, the, in, in Mark, he starts out casting out demons. In John, he starts out turning water into wine. So depending on which wow. gospel you read, that was the first miracle, which is they both can't be first, right? <laughs> so there's so many, there's so many problems with it. But our, our lesson, basically, in a nutshell, is the Messiah will come to earth, be born, a regular person, physically sit on the throne of David. The world will physically be at peace. It will be a reality. It will not be a belief. I don't believe that our president is the president. I know it. I see him at the White House, right? You don't believe that the sun is shining outside. I go outside and it's there. It's, this is, these are not beliefs. These is, this is reality. I don't believe I have children. I don't, you know, the Tanakh tells you to know I am God. Know that you no. should do A, B, C. Know these things. Belief is a part of life. We know we have to believe things, but I, I, as, as a rule of thumb, it should be displayed. I can tell you I believe in God, but if I don't show you that, if I'm stealing money from you and I'm cursing you out and I'm being disrespectful, do are you going to believe me? No. You're going to mm -hmm. be like, nah, he say that. <laughs> it sounds good, but... I don't see it. I don't know that you believe it. You don't show that to me. Mm -hmm. So the Tanakh is a show me book. Sh show me yeah. this reality. 
There's a place called Israel. We can get an airplane today and go to Israel. It's not a belief in my mind. It's, a, it's a state called yeah. Israel. Yeah. So there is no kingdom of God on earth, as the New Testament says, the time is fulfilled. No, it's not. That was a mm. lie. So we'll deal with the rest of these prophecies um, next week. And um, T.O., got anything else to say? No, I think uh, you captured it correctly. Thank you very much. And uh, let's meet again next week when we'll be, we will be discussing Zechariah um, uh, 12 and 13. 12, 13, and 14. Yep. And 14, yeah. Thank All right. Well, much. shalom, everybody. We'll see you next week.